here is your unit five review. Remember, you are in control of pausing, rewinding, fast forwarding. But if, if you haven't worked these yet, just working this with me is not necessarily going to help you as much as if you were actually to have worked through these first and then maybe check yourself or if you needed to hear more explanation, whatever. But it will definitely be better for you if you have worked through this on your own a little bit. Okay. So let f be the function defined by f of x. On which of the following intervals is the graph of f both decreasing and concave up? Okay, so one way I can know for sure what I'm looking for is the fun chart. So you got a couple of options here. You can write it each time you need it. You can write it once at the top and refer to it. I'm going to write it each time I need it, though, so I'm not having to scroll back and forth. If I had a piece of paper in front of me, I could just look at the top, but that makes it more difficult on this board. But let's look at what we have here. Okay, so when f is decreasing, so when f is decreasing, f prime is negative. When it is concave up, then f double prime is positive, and f prime is increasing. So if I had a graph, the fact that f prime is increasing could be helpful, but I don't have a graph, so since I have what I have is an equation, then these are the two things that I am looking at, which means I need the first and second derivatives. So let's find the first derivative. f prime of x equals 6x squared minus 6x minus 12. And then I'll find the second derivative, f double prime of x equals 12x minus 6. Okay, so then I need to find the zeros of both. So I could have <clears throat> found the zeros of the derivative before the second, but whatever. So 0 is equal to, and I'm going to factor out my 6, 6 times x squared minus x minus 2. So that gives me 0 equals 6 times x minus 2 times x plus 1. So my x values are negative 1 and 2 for f prime. Then I have f double prime. Let's find those zeros. 0 is equal to, I'm going to factor my 6 out again, 6, and this gives me 2x minus 1. So that means that x is equal to 1 half. So one thing, as I worked through this earlier, I'm not sure, I, can't, I, don't, I think it's weird that we didn't do a question where we had both of these. I think we were doing everything kind of individually, like when is it decreasing and when is it concave up, not when is it decreasing and concave up. So you can work this exactly like the ones we've been working. But when we're looking for both of these things at the same time, I can also just put them on one number line. So I'm going to do it that way, just to show you what I'm talking about here. So I have three numbers that are going on this number line. I have a negative 1, I have a 1 half, and I have a 2. So on the bottom is going to be my f prime. Well, actually, we'll put them on top. Because I'm going to just, what I'm doing is I'm putting them in the order that they're on here. So f prime up here and f double prime down here. But again, as long as you know which is which, it really makes absolutely no difference. So then I'm going to check each interval for each function. Meaning if I'm going to go some, somewhere between negative infinity and negative 1, so let's do negative 2. If I substitute negative 2 in here, this is going to give me negative times negative, which is positive. Okay. Then between negative 1 and 1 half, I can put in a 0. So 0 here, here, negative times a positive, which is a negative. And then somewhere between 1 half and 2 would be like 3 fourths. So 3 fourths minus 2, that's negative times negative. I'm sorry, negative times positive, that's negative again. Somewhere between 2 and infinity is like 3, so that'd be positive and positive, positive. Now, that should hopefully make sense to you because... We expect the sign change at these two. We don't expect a sign change here at the one half. So the fact that that stays negative here and here hopefully makes some sense to you. 
but putting it on one chart can kind of help you narrow down what you're trying to figure out a little easier here. All right, so now we're going to do the same thing for double F double prime. So between, uh, and we only expect a sign change here, right? It's the only place we expect it. We don't have any bounces or anything, you know, so we really should alternate, but I'm going to take you through the actual sign chart way, then we'll talk about it. So negative 2, if I substitute a negative 2 in here, this is going to be negative. If I substitute 0 in here, this is going to be negative. If I substitute 3 fourths in here, this is going to be positive. If I substitute 3 in here, this is going to be positive. So by putting them both on there, it just chops it up a little bit more. But this is where we expect our sign change for the second derivative, and this is where we expect our sign changes for the first derivative. But by doing that, I can see that what I remember what I was looking for here is when f prime is negative. So let's go over here and highlight again. f prime is negative here and here. And when f double prime is positive, that's here and here. What I'm looking for is when both things happen, and both things are happening right here. Okay, so between from one half to two, which makes my answer D. Okay. Now again, you could have done it straight up like let's find where it's decreasing, and then let's find where it's concave up, and then you're gonna have to see where they overlap anyway. So that's just kind of a way of doing it all in one sign chart. All right, let's look at number two. The function f has a first derivative. So I'm given the first derivative. I want to know at what values of x does it have a relative maximum? Okay, relative maximum. So I'm going to rewrite my fun chart. Prime, f double prime. Okay. So what I'm looking for, I have f prime. I want to know when f has a relative maximum. So relative maximum will be right here, and literally right there, because it'll be changing from increasing to decreasing. That gives me a relative maximum. So by using f prime, I want to know when f prime changes, not just changes signs, but specifically from positive to negative. Okay, so I'm going to write myself right here. What this means is that f prime goes from positive to negative. That's what I'm looking for, okay? Now, I already have the derivative, and it's already factored for me. It's like an extra sweet bonus. So from here, I get my zeros. X is equal to zero, three, and negative one. And I'm gonna put them on a little sign chart here. I didn't write them down in order. I've gotta make sure I put them in order on here or nothing makes sense. Right, so then f prime down here to figure out my signs. So if I substitute in a negative 2, this is going to be negative. This will always be positive because it's being squared. So really it's kind of irrelevant. I'm just looking at these two. So negative 2 would give me negative times a negative, which is positive. Negative 1 half will give me negative times positive, which is negative. If I substitute in a 1, that give me positive times positive which is positive, and if I substitute in 4, positive times positive, which is positive. So notice this one didn't alternate, but that's because here, that's where I would have my, like my bounce or my tangency, if you remember when we sketched polynomials. Um, but if you're not sure when those things would happen, going through each little section with your signs is the safest way to do it for sure. So then what this tells us is for f, if f prime is positive, then we are increasing then decreasing, then increasing, then increasing, right? So that means here, I want to know where do we change from positive to negative. I can look at the signs here, but I can also just look here that, okay, this is the only place I could actually see a relative maximum there because this would be a relative minimum and this would be neither. So it's at negative one only, which is A, right? Number three, let f be the function defined by f of x. The graph of f, graph of f is concave down when, right? So again, 
right now you might want to write this over and over again to make sure you can always write it correctly. But again, you could just have it written once at the top of the paper to refer to. It's up to you. Sometimes I like to actually circle and highlight mine, so it's not a bad idea to rewrite it. All right, so I'm looking at when F is concave down. That is right here. Now, I can either look at F prime or I could look at F double prime. If all I have is the equation and not a graph, then F prime is not going to help me. Oops, goodness. Because I can't tell from my equation. I can get my sign charts from my equation when I factor, but it doesn't tell me this. This is what I'm going to need to look at. So I actually need F double prime, which we can totally do. So this is F. So I want F prime of x, that is 6x squared minus 6x minus 12. Then I need F double prime. I don't care about, I don't care about the zeros here. F double prime of x is equal to 12x minus 6. I set that equal to 0. Go ahead and factor out my 6. And I get 2x minus 1. So I get that x equals 1 half. Make my sign chart, and there's one half here. This is F double prime. So if I substitute in zero here, zero here is going to give me negative. If I substitute in one, that'll give me positive. So we are changing from negative to positive. That's not what we're looking for, though, right? F double prime is negative, that means it's concave down, that's what we're being asked for. So it is from 0 to 1 half, or when x is it, when x is greater than 1 half, or when x is less than 1 half, make sure you know which way the alligator mouth opens so you don't mess something like that up. Okay? All right. Definitely in calculus, don't want to be messing up on the alligator mouth. He eats the bigger number. All right, F double prime. So I have the second derivative. F has inflection points. Okay, so let's do our sign, or I'm sorry, our fun chart. Okay, okay. So my inflection points happen when F changes concavity, and F changes, con this is, where f would change concavity. I know I'm dealing with the, the second derivative because we don't know how to go backwards yet, so I'm looking at this here, and it changes concavity when f prime, uh, f double prime changes sign. Okay, so that's where our inflection points are, and it's not asking if we're changing from concave up to concave down, just in general. We could be going in either direction, and so I want to know where it changes signs. Once again, this beautifully has the, it's already all factored for me. So this right here tells me that x is equal to 0, negative 1, and 2. And I'm going to put that on my sign chart, negative 1, 0, and 2. F double prime. Okie dokie. So if I put in a negative 2. Now, this right here, I'm squaring it, so this is positive no matter what, so he's really irrelevant. I'm just looking at these two. Negative 2 in there and there, that's two negatives, give me a positive. If I put in negative 1 half, that'd be a negative times a positive, which is negative. And then 0, 2, I could put in a 1, positive, positive, and then positive, positive. Okay, so this is what's happening here. I want to think about it on here. When F double prime is positive, this is concave up, this is concave down, concave up, concave up. So where are we changing concavity? Here and here. So at negative 1 and 0 only, which is C. Okie dokie. For X equals, I'm sorry, for X is greater than 0, F or, oh, I'm sorry, oh my gosh, for x is greater than zero, I don't know what I actually said. f is a function such that f prime, so they give me the 
first derivative and the second derivative. So isn't that nice? You didn't even have to take the derivative of natural logs or anything. Which of the following is true? Okay, so we are looking for whether f is decreasing or increasing and whether it's concave up or concave down. So let's look at our fun chart. Okay. So if f is increasing or decreasing, that comes from the signs of f prime. And if it's concave up or concave down, that comes from the sign of f double prime. Now, if you have a rational, which is what we have, because this is it, we have a variable in the denominator, then we have to not only look at when the function is equal to zero, but when it is undefined. So when you set the numerator equal to zero, that's when the function is equal to zero. So we're going to say natural log of x is equal to zero. When you set the denominator equal to zero, that's when the function is undefined. So we're going to do that for both of them. So we've got the natural log of x equals zero, got to solve for x, and then we nicely just have x equals zero here. Well, okay, natural log of x equals zero, and I need to know what x is. This is where you have to have a good idea. If you don't just know, which I would imagine some of you don't, you have to have an idea of what your parent functions look like. Okay, we've talked about e to the x a lot. So for e to the x, he looks like this, right? So we know for an e to the x that it's never going to equal zero, right? And your y-intercept is one, that's important, okay? So e and natural logs, those are inverses of each other. So if I take this, an inverse, remember, is reflected along the line y equals x. So it would look like this. This is your natural log of x graph, okay? So when does natural log equal zero? Natural log equals zero right here. Well, it's the inverse of this. And e to the zero power is one. So this little point here, this is one. So what we get right here, x equals one. You can also look at it as, just kind of giving another natural log thing to think about here, natural log of x equals zero. That's the same thing as log base e of x equals zero, right? Because your natural log, the base is zero. If you remember, maybe instead of this, maybe you remember better how to rewrite them. I don't, I think for most people the graph will be easier to remember, but if I redid this, and I rewrote it, this would give me e to the zero power equals x. That's how you rewrite a log to an exponent, to an exponential. So e to the zero, you still get x equals one. Little side note, you can erase that out of your brain if that made things worse. Okay, so I have these two things here. Now I also need to do this for f double prime. So here I'm gonna say that one minus the natural log of x equals zero, and that x squared equals zero. Well, this one's easy. If x squared equals zero, x equals zero. And here, this would give me that one equals the natural log of x, okay? So when does the natural log of x equal one? Right here, that would be a one. Well, e to the first would be right here. And if e to the first, then the natural log of e has to equal one and x equals e. All right, little things we have to know. And again, if I was to rewrite this, so if I was going to rewrite it as a log, I don't want to confuse things, but the natural log of x equals one, so log base e of x equals one. When you rewrite, it's that this to this power equals this. So e to the first equals x. That's how I got x equals e. That's another way, either from the graph or from understanding how it works. Whatever works, as long as you know it. Okay. So we're going to do, I'm going to do another one of those double sign charts. I've got to put in there a 1, a 0, so it shows up twice, and an e. So do you have to know the exact value of e? No. You just have to know where it falls in those three numbers. 
So we got 0, 1, and E. Hopefully you know it's at least more than 1. It's 2.7 something, okay? So 0, 1, and E. 0, 1, and E. Then we're going to put F prime on top. And we're going to put F double prime on the bottom. Okay. Now, do I have to fill in absolutely everything? No, because look at what we're looking at here. We are looking at F is decreasing, so it's only X is greater than zero. So I don't even care about this part right here, right? But it's only asking me for when X is these all, all of these say X is greater than one, and all of these say X is greater than E, right? So I don't even care about that part. All I care about are the other two, when X is greater than one, when X is greater than E. So that's all we need to look at. So let's look at F of do, F double prime. Or, well, we'll do F prime first. We'll do the top first. It doesn't really matter. So something greater than one and less than E. Let's go with two, okay? So the natural log of two over two. All right, so I know what you're thinking. I don't know what the natural log of two is. Well, you at least know the denominator's positive, right? Well, if this is my natural log function and this is one, the natural log of two has to be positive. So that's positive over positive, which is positive. Now let's do something bigger than E, like 100, if you don't know what E is. 100 in the denominator is positive. 100 over here is gonna be way out here. It's still positive. This is positive, okay? So for my F prime, F prime here, it's positive the whole time. So that means that F is increasing. So I can mark out those two. Now let's look at the second one. Something bigger than one. Let's go with two, okay? So one minus one, something bigger than one and less than E is what I'm trying to do. One minus the natural log of two over two squared. So the denominator is going to be positive no matter what. Okay, so the natural log of two is a positive number. What you have to decide is, is it going to be bigger or smaller than one? So natural log of two. Okay, so remember that the natural log of E gives you one. So natural log of E gives me one then two is less than E, so that's gonna have to give me something less than one, which is going to make this positive. Then something bigger than E, like 100, if you don't know what E is. So if E gives me one, then something way bigger than E is gonna have to give me something bigger than one, and one minus something bigger than one is gonna give me a negative number. So we know when X is greater than E, F double prime is negative, which makes F concave down, which is C. Don't freak out when you see stuff you're not sure of. Use some reasoning skills, think through it, take deep breaths, you will be okay. You've got this. Let's look at Number six. <clears throat> okay. The graph of F prime. F prime. Make sure you know what graph you're looking at. The derivative of the function F is shown above. On which of the following intervals is F decreasing? Okay, so here's my fun chart again. If you write it over and over again, you should never write it wrong because you will know exactly what it is. Don't just think about it in your head. Write it down at least once, you stubborn people. Okay. <clears throat> so, F is decreasing. F is decreasing when F prime is negative. I have a graph of F prime. F prime is negative here and here. Therefore, F is decreasing from 0 to 2 and from 4 to 6, which is D. Now, another way to do this and what I think is good for you sometimes, especially if the, the question was a little bit more complicated, 
don't forget that you can very easily make a sign chart from a graph, okay? So the sign chart for F prime here, I look for my zero, zero, two, four, and six. So zero, two, four, and six. 0, 2, 4, and 6. And maybe you feel like it's not necessary for you on this question, which is fine, but I want you to make, remember how to do this, so if it helps you more on another question, that will be good, okay? So this is F prime. And then I can look on here. Well, I start at 0, so I don't really care about that part. And I actually go to 7 over here, so whatever. We'll go from 0 to 2 here. And so from 0 to 2, I can see that this is negative. From two to four, I see that it's positive. From four to six, it's negative. And from six to seven, it's positive. Which means for F, then decreasing, increasing, decreasing, increasing, that's another way to get your answer. Okay? Which again, can come in very helpful on some other types of questions. So don't forget that you don't have to have an equation to come up with a sign chart. Number seven. Okay, the function y equals g of x is differentiable and increasing for all real numbers. Differentiable and increasing for all real numbers. On what intervals is the function y equals blah, 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 is this increasing? Okay, so one of the reasons I love math is that they're like little puzzles. And is every, every question that you get is not going to look exactly like something you have seen before. Instead, you've got to ask yourself, like, what do I know? If you're like, I write, if you read this and you're like, what the heck? I don't have, I don't know what G of, I don't even know what G of X is. How am I supposed to know what G of X cubed minus 6X squared is? Okay, so don't, don't worry about what you don't know. Focus on what you do know. So we're going to start with, here's what I'm going to think. Well, it's differentiable. We're talking about increasing. That's been using our fun chart. So let's write our fun chart down. Let me take you through a thought process here. If at any point you're like, oh, now I get it, like if you really couldn't even start this problem, then pause this. See if you can get any farther without me just walking you through every single step. Okay, so here's what I know. I know that if g or y equals g of x my y, if that is increasing, if it is increasing, that means it's positive. So what this is telling me is that g prime is always positive. Okay, because if g is always increasing, then g prime has to always be positive. That's something that I know. And so I want to know when it's increasing, okay, when this one is increasing, this y equals g of that. When is that increasing? So in order to find that, I'm thinking I need to know what the derivative is. Now they called it y instead of f of x or h of x or whatever. Um, we like to steer away from, from y prime. So instead, remember, if I'm going to take the derivative of y, Another way to write that is dy dx. Now, this is a multiple choice question. If you wrote y prime, it's not the end of the world, but just let me remember what's happening there. So then we're going to take the derivative of this. If you haven't yet done that, I want you to pause this, do the derivative, then unpause it. Okay, so I'm going to continue, and if you haven't even tried it yet, you should try it. But I'm going to ask you a question. And so let's see, what process or what rule am I going to have to use here? The answer to that question, to take the derivative of this, is chain rule. So if you tried to take the derivative and you didn't do the chain rule, now pause it, go back and do the chain rule, and see if you can finish it, and then come back. Okay, I'm going to trust that we've all at least attempted something now. So when I take the derivative of this, chain rule says, Derivative of the outside, leave the inside alone, times the derivative of the inside, which is going to give me 3x squared minus 12x. Okay. Now, 
let me remind you of something that is super very important. I absolutely, positively, 1,000% cannot multiply these two binomials together. This is just a plain old binomial that you've seen for years, right? This is all one thing stuck together now. These X's in here don't mix with these X's in here. Okay, so be careful on things like that. I think you're less likely to do it here, and where I've seen it more is maybe if you just took the derivative and this part was like just three, you might want to try to distribute it. That's a big fat no, so we're not doing that, okay? So now, what we're going to do here, just like we've done before, right? We took the derivative. We are now going to set the derivative equal to zero, okay? And find the zeros. So zero is equal to g prime of x cubed minus 6x squared. And I'm going to go ahead and factor this a little bit because I can, right? So I can factor out a 3x out of this. So this is times 3x times x minus 4. I could have done that on the next step, but hopefully you see what, how all that works, right? So now we're here, and we've set it equal to 0. Now, can I actually find the zeros here? And the answer to that is no. But let's think about why we do that. We put that on the sign chart. We put our zeros on the sign chart to figure out if things are positive or negative. Well, guess what we already figured out? Because we read our question and thought about what we knew before we started and got lost in the math. We wrote down g prime is always positive. So this is always positive. So the zeros are irrelevant because I substitute stuff back in. And so I, it's not like I can't just factor this and get the zeros of what's on the inside. That's a completely different process there. So what I'm really doing is just finding the zeros here. So my zeros and what's going to go on my sign chart, x equals 0 and 4. I'm going to make my sign chart 0 and 4. If I substitute in, this is for dy dx, right? Or y prime, if that helps you, or you could have renamed it f of x if that, you know, makes you help you wrap your mind around it. Um, something less than zero, and again, this is always positive. So substituting into there doesn't matter, always positive. So a negative one in here is negative times negative, that's positive. Substitute in a one, that's positive times negative, which is negative. Substitute in a five, that's positive times positive, which is positive. Which tells me that, let's see, what was I even looking for here? I was looking for when that function is increasing. So I know that this y that I was looking at is increasing, decreasing, increasing. So it's increasing from negative infinity to 0 and 4 to infinity, which is a. So when you read something and you think, I don't have any idea. I don't know how to do this. We've never done this. You totally know how to do it. You need to get over yourself, stop telling yourself you don't know what to do, and figure out what you actually know and go from there. Don't focus on what you don't know. Focus on what you do know. That's how you get stuff out of your brain. All right, number eight. The table above gives selective values for the differentiable function f. In which of the following intervals must there be a number c? That should set off little bells and whistles in your head that says, must there be a number c? That most likely means it's either IVT or MVT. Then we keep reading, such that f prime of t equals 2. Now, just because it's a derivative doesn't mean that that doesn't guarantee you one way or the other. But either I'm looking for missing numbers in the table, which the table's talking about f, and this is f prime, so that's not it. I'm being asked about the rate of change. So if, if this said f of c equals 2, then it would be IVT, because then those two would match. They don't match, which means it's MVT. Okay? For either one, what we are doing is we are looking, for, we have to find values, but we have that. MVT, that's the mean value theorem. So we are looking for um, average rate of change. Now, this question, instead of asking you um, 
specifically what it is, it's saying which intervals. So you kind of have to check each one of these. So here we'll check, we'll start with A. So we're going to do F of 6 minus F of 2 over 6 minus 2. Okay, so F of 6, F of 6 is 2 minus F of 2 is 10 over 4. So that would give me negative 8 over 4. That's negative 2. I'm looking for 2, not my answer. Do it again. F of 10 minus F of 6 over 10 minus 6. So F of 10 is 4 minus F of 6, which is 2 over 4. So that's going to give me, what, 1 half. Either way, that is definitely not 2. Okay, so now let's do this one, f of 14 minus f of 10 over 14 minus 10. So f of 14 is 12 minus f of 10, which is 4 over 4, gives me 8 over 4, which is 2. So I'm pretty sure I like this one because that's what I'm looking for. So I think this is it. You really should always check all of them. Unless you're about to run out of time, then go, go with that one. But F, uh, you, know, you know, you never know. Maybe you read the question wrong or something. Because if I get two here, I'm going to have to go reevaluate everything. 18 minus 14. So F of 18 is 3 minus 12 over 4. Well, that's obviously going to give me a negative number. And so that's not it. So my answer is C. All right, number nine. What is the value of x which the minimum value of this function occurs on this closed interval? Okay, so the minimum value on a closed interval, that means candidates test. Okay, so we're going to have to do an x and an f of x. And on here, we are going to have the endpoints of the interval, 0, and 1. And then we are going to have to find the derivative and find our zeros to put in our chart, then go from there. So again, if you haven't already found the derivative, find the derivative, pause and make that happen. Okay, so 4 thirds times 6, I'm going to give me 24 over 3, which is 8, times x minus 1 to the 1 third power minus 4. I set that equal to 0. I'm going to go ahead and make that 8 times the cube root of x, because I like that better, minus 4. So then add 4 to both sides. I would not skip steps on things like this, because this is where you make weird, silly mistakes, even though you know how to do algebra. So I divide by 8, and I get 1 half. That's equal to the cube root of x. To undo a cube root, I cube it. So x equals 1 half cubed, which is 1 eighth. And I only have one zero in my derivative, so I only have one other number that goes right here. Okay. So then I need to find the values. Remember, I go back to the original one. This is f of x. So I want f of 0. Well, that's just going to be 0. Then I have f of 1 eighth. So that's going to be 6 times 1 eighth to the 4 thirds power minus 4 times 1 eighth. So that's not beautiful, but you can do that. Don't make up math and don't freak out. Okay, so 1 eighth to the 4 thirds power. So basically what that means, this is 1 eighth, it's the cube root of 1 eighth to the fourth. Now, I can either take 1 eighth to the fourth and then take the cube root or take the cube root first. The order does not matter. Do what, whatever would be easier. I definitely think it would be easier to take the cube root first. So the cube root of 1 eighth is 1 half. So then I have 1 half to the fourth. So if 1 half to the third is 1 eighth, then to the fourth would be 1 sixteenth. So this gives me 6 times 1 sixteenth minus... Now watch this. I know that's one half. I'm going to leave it as four eighths because 
When I do 6 times 16, that'll give me 6 over 16, which gives me 3 eighths minus 4 eighths. See how I didn't have to go back and get a common denominator? And I get negative 1 eighth. Think smarter, not harder. Don't let fractions freak you out. Since it's multiple, you know, on other things, remember I said, oh, look, we could have just like left it like that. But even if this was a free response question, you can't really leave it like this because you need to know the basic value to figure this stuff out. If it was something where you could at least figure out that it was going to be negative, but I don't know that all of you would be able to see that inside of there. Then I need f of 1. So that's going to give me 6 times 1 to all. That's just 6 minus 4. That's just 2. Okay. And we were looking for the absolute minimum. And notice what this says. This says at what value of x. So it is asking you at what value. This is the minimum value. Okay. This is the where. This is the what. And it's saying, well, it does say what, but this is the x is the where. So at x equals 1 8, the minimum value is negative 1. That's why that's a positive and not a negative there. Okay. Here's another one that is a total puzzle. It makes you, makes you think, and again, you can think more than you realize sometimes. So h is twice differentiable function with h prime, with, gives us this information here for all real numbers x, and then it gives us two values of h. And I want to know which of these three numbers are possible values for h of 5. We have no idea what any of the equations look like, but from this, we do kind of have an idea of what the graph looks like. So let's write out our fun chart. Okay, here's what we know. If h prime is greater than zero, that means that it's positive. So when the prime is positive, f is increasing. Then when h double prime is greater than zero, that's positive. So when double is positive, it's concave up. So the function that we're interested in is increasing and concave up the whole time. Okay. Not only that, but we know that a couple of things here. Let's put this on our graph here. Let's say that this point is, because they give us this, this is our function. So this is like 2, 10, right? Then we'll say this is 4, 16, because I'm getting that from here. Then it wants to know what are some possible values for 5, right? Hmm. Well, pretty confident. It's got to be bigger than 16, but we already knew that, right? We can only choose 18, 19, and 20. So let's look at what would make the most sense here. We know not only these things, but if f double prime is positive, then f prime is increasing. The slope is increasing. Think about that for a second. If the rate of change is increasing, so it's getting bigger, right? It's not staying the same. It is increasing. So from 2 to 4, we went up by 6, right? So my rate of change there, that is 16 minus 10 over 4 minus 2. So that's going to give me 6 over 2, which is 3, right? So for every 1 Okay, sorry, I had to pause and I have absolutely no idea what the last thing out of my mouth was. So here's what we did. Between these two points, this was our average rate of change, right? So I want you to think MVT. That means somewhere between these two points, the slope was three, okay? The slope was three at some point. I don't know where, I don't care. But because of that and because my slope is increasing, then once I get to four, my slope is actually already greater than three. And I don't know how much greater, but it's greater than 3. So by the time I get to 5, it should be greater than 3, 2, plus this average rate of change. And so if I do something, 
if I did three here, that would be 19, but I know it has to be greater than three, which means 20 is my only answer that makes sense. Okay. Number 11. Let f be a function defined on this closed interval. Okay, that's what I have on my graph. They tell me f of 1 is 3. The graph of f prime, this is f prime, not f. The derivative of f consists, consists of two semicircles. Okay, that's what they look like, but that's good to know because that helps me know the reason that this is important, and it may or may not affect us in this question, is that if it's a semicircle and I can see here that the radius is 1, then I know for sure this is at 1. And if I can see that the radius is 2, then I know for sure this is at negative 2. There's no guessing there. It's one reason why they tell us that. Okay, so from for negative 5 to 5, find all the values of x, all the value, values of x at which f has a relative maximum and we have to justify our answer. So I do think that it would be helpful here if we did a sign chart with the graph, okay? So we're going to write our fun chart first so that we have that. And then I'm going to do my sign chart, and on my sign chart, I'm going to have all of my zeros, which is negative 5, negative 3, 1, and 4, okay? Down here, we will have f prime, so we're actually starting at negative 5, so I don't need that part, but from negative 5 to negative 3, we're positive, then we're negative, then we're positive, then we're negative which means that for f, we are increasing, then decreasing, then increasing, and decreasing. Okay, so what we want, we want to find all the values of x for which f has a relative maximum. So relative maximum occurs here and here, right? Because I can going from increasing to decreasing, this would be a relative minimum. So I got two right here. So I need to state that, I need to say that F has a relative max at, okay, at X equals negative three and X equals four because, now remember, I cannot say because F changes from increasing to decreasing because how do we know that? We know because they gave us f prime. So we have to talk about f prime. So I have to say because f prime changes, remember I can't just say changes signs, I'm gonna say changes from positive to negative. That's how that works, okay? Alrighty, so. I want to find all the intervals on which, all the intervals, so this isn't going to be an x equals, concave up and also has a positive slope, okay? So that means that if it's, if we are concave up, so let me write our, let's do our little fun chart, fun chart, yeah. All right, so F concave up, F is concave up when F prime is increasing, right? And when F, F has a positive slope. Positive slope for F looks like this. So what we are looking for is when F prime is increasing and positive. That's what we're looking for. Right? So F prime is increasing and positive. So here is where F prime is increasing and it's positive. That's good. Then we start to decrease. We're still decreasing. Then we're increasing, but that's not positive. Then we're increasing, but we're positive. Then we decrease. Right? So I'm going from negative 5 to 4 and 1 to 2. 
So then I can say, now, one thing I could do is because I already wrote this, F is increasing and positive. I wrote down what I was looking for. I have that there. I can just continue on and say F prime is increasing and positive on negative five to negative four and one to two. Therefore, F is concave up with a positive slope. Okay. Positive slope really just means F prime is positive. Think about that. Okay. All righty. Same interval, all values of x for which f has a point of inflection. Okay, so I'm going to redo my fun chart here. Okay, point of inflection occurs when there is a change in concavity right here. So that means I am looking for where F prime, because that's the graph that I have. Now we've been looking at points of inflection where F double prime changes from negative to, or changes signs, and that's totally fine. But um, it's also when F prime changes from increasing to decreasing or vice versa, okay? So I can say, let's go up here and let's figure out where we change from increasing to decreasing and vice versa. So increasing to decreasing right here, then we're decreasing to here, then we start increasing, then we're increasing to here. So I got three points here, okay? Three of them. And I wanna talk, I have to talk about F prime. So it's when F prime is changing from increasing to decreasing and vice versa. And remember we can, if we're talking about F double prime, we can just say that it changes signs. We don't care which, which way. We also don't care which way increasing and decreasing, so you can say it a couple of different ways. Me personally, for me, it's easier for me to write it out if I just go ahead and split them up and just talk about it one instead of saying vice versa or whatever. I get my, I don't like those words. Um, so, I, so I don't like the words, they just don't come out of my brain, right? So instead, I would say that F has a point of inflection and this also helps you, like it says, all values of x. So I know I'm not looking for an interval. A point of inflection at, okay. So let's go back up here. I have three of them. So here we're changing from increasing to decreasing. This one's decreasing to increasing. This one is increasing to decreasing. So I think I'll go from increasing to decreasing first just because it shows up first. So I'm going to use these two numbers. So I'm going to say at x equals negative 4 and x equals 2 because f prime changes from increasing to decreasing also at x equals so this one was here at negative one because F prime changes from decreasing to increasing. Okay. So remember that the order there, it doesn't, really matter for a point of inflection. So I could have said F has a point of inflection at X equals negative four, X equals negative one, and X equals two, because F prime changes from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing, or put a vice versa in there, whatever. I just feel like this is a little bit more clear, and I like this better, but the other is, I think, acceptable. Isn't it? It's better to be safe than sorry, right? Okay. Oh, are we done? Nope, where's my other, oh goodness. Uh-oh, I lost a question somewhere. Okay, BRB, hang on. 
All righty, number 12 is back. Rescued him. Here we go. The figure above shows the graph of f prime, the derivative of function f, closed interval, negative 1 to 5. The graph of f prime has no horizontal tangent lines. Oh, no. Oh, my gosh. Has, has horizontal. I don't know where no came from. Has horizontal tangent lines at x equals 1 and x equals 3, which if they didn't tell you that, I think that's something that you could see from the graph. The function is twice differentiable with f of 2 equal to 6. Okay. So let's look at this. Find the x-coordinate of each point of inflection. X-coordinate, not an interval, point of inflection. So I think that's what we just did. Let's do it again. Oops. Let's, let's write our fun chart down correctly. Prime. Double prime. Okie dokie. So we want point of inflection happens here. We are talking about F prime. So it's where F prime changes from increasing to decreasing and vice versa. So I'm increasing, then decreasing, and I'm decreasing, then increasing. Notice that's also where my horizontal tangents happen there. And so at those two points, and so I can say, let's see, that's negative, I'm sorry, that's one and three. And one is from increasing to decreasing. Sorry, as soon as I scroll, I forget what I was even looking at. All right, so then I can say that F has a point of inflection. And let me remind you, it is inflection, not infection. It's not sick. Point of inflection at x equals 1 because f prime changes from increasing to decreasing. Also, at x equals 3, because f prime changes from decreasing to increasing. All right, there we go. Okay, find all the intervals. So now it says intervals, not x values where the graph is both concave down and decreasing. We're going to explain our reasoning. Okay, so let's do our fun chart again. Again, you wouldn't have to do it over and over again. If you want to label it, I think it's helpful, but I don't want to have to scroll back and forth and point to things for you. <clears throat> F double prime. Okay, <clears throat> so if I want F to be concave down, and decreasing, I need f prime to be decreasing and negative. Okay, that's what I'm looking for here. So that means that I want f prime to be decreasing. Or that's, that happens when f prime is decreasing and negative. If I go ahead and write that down, I already have part of my <clears throat> Part of my answer written. Okay, so let's look at this. My function, which is f prime, is decreasing here, and it's negative the whole time it's decreasing, right? This part here is increasing, so is this. So this just happens to be decreasing, and the function is negative, which means my y values are negative. So I can say f prime is decreasing and negative on... 1 to 3, therefore f is both concave down and decreasing. Okay, there you go. All right, last part here. Let g be the function defined by this. Find an equation of the line tangent. That should set off bells and whistles also of g at x equals 2. Equation of the tangent line. Ooh, I need a point. And I need the slope. 
and it's g of x. So my point is 2, comma, g of 2, and my slope is g prime of 2. So let's see what we need to do here. First, I need to find g of 2. So g of 2 is equal to 2 times f of 2. Right? Well, f of 2, they told me back up there at the top, right above the a, it says f of 2 equals 6. So this is equal to 2 times 6, which is 12. So my ordered pair here is 2, 12. So then I need to find the derivative. So g prime of x, if you haven't already found the derivative, pause this video, find the derivative, then come back. And let's see if we agree. I'm going to trust. Let me go on. Trust that everybody's actually tried to find it. Got to use the product rule here. So the derivative of the first, which is 1, times the second, plus the first times the derivative of the second. Okay, so then g prime of 2, which is what I need for my slope, is going to be f of 2 plus 2 times f prime of 2. So I know that f of 2, I already figured that out, that was 6, they told me that, plus 2 times, well they didn't tell me what f prime of 2 is, and I don't have an equation, so where do we find f prime of 2? I go back up here, check this out. Here's f prime. When x is 2, y is negative 1. So this is times a negative 1, which would give me 4. So g prime of 2 equals 4. So here are the two pieces of information that I need to write the equation of the line. My line would be y equals my slope, which is 4, times x minus 2 plus 12. And there you go. You got this. You have the knowledge and skills to do this. You have to believe in yourself and think positively and not make up math. And do your homework and be good people.